Okay. Uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, we've got a panel discussion lined up for today. I'd like to thank everyone for submitting questions. Uh, we have a lot of questions to get through. Uh, but first, let's meet our panelists. Um, Lance, would you like to start? Oh, sure. Yeah, my name is Lance Casper, and I'm a, a technical specialist for BioColumns or, or a field application scientist. And I work directly with customers and being able to help them with method development or column recommendations for any kind of biomolecule analysis. So proteins, peptides, oligos, glycans, amino acids, um, et cetera. Great. Thanks, Lance. Uh, John? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is John Yan. I'm an applications chemist with Agilent, um, supporting the uh, glycan consumables portfolio. Thanks, John. Um, David. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is David Wong. Uh, I'm an application scientist in the LCMS solution team in the marketing uh, division. So my uh, primary uh, main focus is on the biopharma application development. Thanks, David. Uh, Kinda. Thanks, Justin. Hi, everyone. This is Kinda Evans, and I am an automation product specialist. I focus on all the automation portfolio for Agilent. Thank you. Thanks, Kinda. And uh, Alad. Hi, my name is Alad Jones. I'm marketing manager for Bioconsumables, um, and that includes um, glycan preparation. Um, standards and glycoenzymes that were brought into the Agilent portfolio as part of the integration of, of Prozone. Thanks, Alan. Thanks again for everybody uh, joining us. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, I think we've got a lot of great questions lined up here. Uh, the first one uh, that I think we should tackle, uh, what are the major analytical challenges of glycan structural characterization? It's a pretty broad topic. Um, John, would you like to get us started? Sure, I can get started on that. Um, so, what are the challenges of analytical? Sorry, the analytical challenges of glycan structural characterization. Is that the question? Um, Correct. One yeah. thing that jumps out to me at first would be um, the different isomers that you can encounter with glycans. So, glycans are made up of multiple monosaccharides. They can be linked in different fashions, and that can those end up being different glycans. Um, so based on that, it can be a uh, challenge to actually decipher the different types of isomers that can be present in a sample. That's probably one of the first things I would think about. Um, so anyone else that has um, something that they want to chime in on? Uh, hi, this is David Wong. Uh, I agree with John. So um, especially for the, uh, the glycan isomer, so because I'm focused on the LCMS uh, side, or the mass spec side of that analytical, uh, area, so I would say um, the, in order to uh, confirm or identify the um, the glycan uh, with a different isomer, so we need a good MSMS fragmentation in order to uh, to do the uh, structural characterization. So uh, uh, a good fragmentation and also a library with all those MSMS data of the uh, the fragment uh, would be really helpful. Great, thanks. Uh, how about any other other uh, structural characterization issues that that you've run across, um, Lance? Is there any solutions from a chromatography perspective that that might be of assistance to people? Um, I, I guess I would point out that maybe speed is a is a challenge uh, because, like you said, with all these structural isomers, we there's a you know you have to take you have to sort of take shortcuts or, you know, you do, you base it on retention times and, um, you know, to really get every single linkage and exactly how that, that glycan, um, you know, the, the complete structural characterization take, it takes some, I guess, some training and yeah, it's, it's more difficult, I guess, than it could be. Yeah. And, and from a chromatography standpoint, some of these samples are, are very complex, so getting full resolution is difficult. Uh, uh, so things like 2D might uh, start to uh, increase in popularity. 
How about use of uh, exoglycosidases for elucidating structures? John or Alan, would you want to touch on that? Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. And, um, you know, I'll just add by, by stepping back, first of all, and, you know, it really is sample dependent um, what the analytical challenges may be. If you have a, if you have a monoclonal antibody based on IgG with only one, one glycosylation site um, and a relatively um, straightforward glycan profile, it might be an easier proposition than, say, an FT fusion with multiple N glycan sites and potentially O glycan sites as well. And that might determine which level you start to look at uh, glycosylation on. You know, there were talks earlier today um, from David and John um, looking at impact mass, um, subunit glycopeptide, and release glycan. Um, and really, what sort of combination of those that you use might, might depend pretty strongly on the molecule um, that you have. Um, with re with regards to exoglycosidases, um, this is um, this is a technique that has been used in the literature for for quite some time, and it can potentially be used to um, to get to that isomer question that John was talking about by using, for example, sialidase to uh, trim off the uh, the terminal sialic acid from from the non-terminal end of the um, from the non-reducing terminal end of the glycans, or galactosidase or hexosaminidase. Uh, to really get the structure ID, and this combined with mass spec um, in terms of getting a mass ID can be pretty powerful. Uh, can, can can be a pretty powerful tool in uh, determining uh, the glycan species that you have in your sample. Great, thanks, Alan. Uh, let's move on to the next question. Um, there's a, a, a multi-part question here uh, that I'm going to direct to David because this is uh, very much what you were speaking to in your presentation earlier. Um, what are some ways to improve glycan detection using peptide mapping and, and what modes and columns are best for getting the most accurate glycan profile? Uh, I do have an APNOX covering the glycopeptide area. So I would say to increase the glycan detection, so uh, first of all, you need a, a column to enrich the glycopeptide. Uh, and also do a good job in the uh, sample cleanup after the enrichment. Um, for the mass spec size, so uh, I think uh, our 6545 QTOF is pretty sensitive already, but you do you can optimize it by tuning the instrument to um, the peptide level. So the the column I normally use for glycopeptide that that is the um, advanced bio. Uh, glycan uh, mapping column, that is the helix based column. And uh, the mass spec I use is just a positive mode for acquisitions. Thanks. There, there's a couple of additional uh, follow up questions to this. Uh, could you provide some tips for achieving deeper coverage of glycans at the glycopeptide level via mass spec? And do you have any tips on reducing metal adducts when analyzing glycopeptides by mass spec? I think from my experience, um, so because I use the, the helix, uh, the glycan mapping column for the glycopeptide separation. So one is, is the uh, the tip is that, um, so once once you um, uh, enrich the, the peptide, uh, glycopeptide and uh, clean up, and when you dry it down, so make sure you uh, resuspend it into about 80% of acyl nitrate solution. Uh, instead of uh, like ninety percent uh, as the um, the uh, dissolve the sample, so so that it won't the the peptide glycopeptide won't precipitate it or is make sure that all the samples go into the solution before you make the injections, and also I start with the five percent of the um, the organic solvent, not not uh, zero percent of water. So that that's make sure the samples is all go into the column for LCMS analysis. For that um, the methyl adduct um, again when you do the after the enrichment, so make sure you do the sample cleanup. Uh, so that would pretty much uh, get rid of the most of the metal adducts in the sample that associate to the glycopeptide. Thanks, David. 
Okay, so the next question I will direct to uh, to Alan and John. Um, regarding rapid testing and, and the rapid kits that we've developed, I think, is, is what this is referencing. How do you confirm the accuracy compared to traditional glycan analysis methods? I guess um, I can start there. No, go ahead, John. Go ahead, Alan. Okay, I'll, I'll start and then I'll hand off to John. But, um, you know, the accuracy in terms of, um, in terms of the relative in terms of the relative percent area readout um, of each glycan species, I think is what the question is getting to. Um, and you know, it's important to determine that um, that you're getting an accurate answer um, in terms of the glycan species that you have there. So, you know, a compare back to a traditional method um, of labeling uh, would be one of it. Um, that coupled with the knowledge that with some older methods, um, there may be um, potential shortcomings in either the deglycosylation labeling or the cleanup steps um, so you know really really taking a look at each of those steps critically um, and seeing if um, seeing if there's a good match between the traditional methods that you have and the and the new method that you're introducing um, I think that's an important step and this is something that we can assist with with our um, with our glyx and glycan sample buckets John I think further to add on that um, yeah, I totally agree with what you just said. Um, I think when we developed these rapid kits, we took a lot of care into making sure that, um, that, that the readouts of the of the, uh, the glycan species were consistent with what we saw with older methods, whether it were, they were traditional methods in the literature or our um, older generation like glycol prep um, workflows, and making sure they were consistent. And if we had you know some type of discrepancy, trying to find an answer to making sure that um, you know we were generating the best answer possible. Thanks. So what about, you know, when, when people are uh, evaluating new methods versus old methods, what are some common uh, problems that they've run into? You know, I, I, areas that they might troubleshoot. And just, uh, you know, from some of my own experience, uh, if people are working off a, uh, an older method that maybe doesn't have a very robust deglycosylation and they're using a, a newer kit that's maybe a little more, more robust, they could see differences there. Uh, what are some area, other areas that people should be aware of as they're maybe transitioning to these uh, newer, more improved uh, methodologies? I guess I can start there this time. Um, so one of the things I know with older methods, um, it also, in addition to the deglycosylation step, there's also the dye labeling step, right? Um, so if you were to let's say there's a traditional method, the traditional deglycosylation step that's overnight, uh, perhaps some some of the glycan species could be lost there. Uh, maybe there's a heating step there. You can maybe there's some silic acids, um, you know, during the or for an, an older method compared to a newer method. And also, we have our new, we also have our new dyes now, right? So we have an instant PC, which is much more sensitive in terms of fluorescence and MS. And MS. So it's possible that you know maybe you could be picking up things that you were not seeing previously in an older method. Great point. Ella, do you have anything to add to that? Not too much to add to that. No, I think that's a good summary. All right. Well, let's move on to the next question then. Um, this will also be another one for John because this is uh, something that he was highlighting in his presentation earlier today. Uh, the question is, is there a good method to quantify salic acid by using HPLC fluorescence? Uh, John, I believe yeah, you alluded so, uh, to uh, some things that we've been working on, so please. Sure, yeah. So I think I talked about that in the presentation earlier today. Um, so. We'll be coming out with a with a new workflow towards the end of the year, I think, that will um, that will basically make this possible. Um, this will be a um, this will be a workflow to release salic acids, label them with a four four, and then separate them by LC, and then you can get um, peaks for the different salic acid species. And um, the workflow will include a um, quantitative standard so that people can generate a standard curve and then um, use fluorescence to um, to find out how much uh, salic acid they have in their samples. Great, thanks, John. Let's see, uh, next question here. Um, would there be differences in salic acid quantitation using mass spec versus fluorescence detection? 
Uh, and, and I'm assuming here the, uh, the person asking the question is referencing more of uh, the silylated glycan species and not, say, release salic acid with DMB. Uh, so, John, would you want to take the first stab at that one? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I think when you're trying to compare fluorescence um, quantitation and MS quantitation, um, we have to understand that uh, there are differences in ways done. Um, so the glycans are labeled one to one with the fluorescent dye. So across like a chromatogram, you can expect that the area under the curve from the fluorescence of the fluorophore would be representative to help give you the um, relative quant that you're looking for. Um, when you're using MS, um, it, it may be looking at um, um, uh, ion counts. Um, it'd be important to make sure, making sure that um, all the potential addicts are accounted for that you could see in, in the mass spectrum to make to make sure that you're accounting for as much as the, of the possible glycan species that are in your sample to make sure that they're they're accounted for when you're trying to relatively quant across maybe a handful of different glycans in your in your spectrum. And I think we have some older app application notes that um, have gone through this. Um, and compared both the fluorescence um, area, or uh, yeah, the fluorescence um, relative percent areas, as well as what can be obtained by um, 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 using mass spec as well. So if you have those out there on the web, I think we can direct people to those if they have um, if they want to look at that data specifically. Great, thanks, John. It looks like we just had another uh, new question come through, which I think is, is a good one for us to chew on. Um, do you think that glycan analysis by CE is limited as compared to HILIC? And what are some main differences to consider? Um, I'd, I'd bounce this one over to, to Alan first to get your thoughts. What do you think? Um, yeah, it's it's an interesting one. Um, you know, as, as people may know, we do have sample preparation kits um, that support capillary electrophoresis or CE, um, most notably APTS. We've done this for quite some time, um, formerly as Prozyme and now as Agilent. And in the past, we've seen CE really be used as quite an effective orthogonal method um, in terms of um, the glycan elution order, or in the case of CE, migration order um, is a little different between LC and CE. You know, in CE, the silated glycans appear first. In LC, um, and HILIC is the most common technique for LC, uh, these appear at the end. So if you have a particularly complicated sample or if you want to increase confidence um, in, your, in your method, CE is a good uh, orthogonal method for this. Um, at least in our hands, we see that um, LC, LC is a little more flexible in terms, of the, um, in terms of the mass spec that you can hyphenate um, on the back end to power up the analysis and get the mass ID. Um, certainly this can be done though with CE. So, I mean, it really depends on your preference and, um, you know, maybe what data you have to uh, compare back to. Um, I would say that both have their place, um, although LC um, seems to be uh, becoming more prevalent at this point, at least for released, at least for released lichen analysis. Great, thanks, Alan. Let's see, looking through all of these questions as we've received to try to find the next candidate here. Um, let's see, so here's a pretty general question. Um, what software tools does Agilent have to facilitate and automate glycan analysis? David, do you want to get us started with that one? Uh, yes, so for, for our biopharma, um, the, the major workflow, we have one workflow called Release Glycan Workflow. So uh, we use the software uh, program called the Outcome Firm. And, and also we have a, a preparatory uh, Glycan uh, database that has about uh, more than 100 Glycan uh, uh, with the accurate mass uh, information. So um, uh, it's all autom automatic uh, data processing and identification in this workflow. Thanks, David. Uh, along the same lines, there's a question about um, achieving identification of unknown glycans and asking, is there a special MSMS -MS software? Um, 
Glycersoft is one uh, at, mentioned as an option. I'm not familiar with that one. And then uh, also asking if IM Mobility can help with isomer ID. I, I can jump in as well. Um, I'm not quite familiar with this, uh, that third party software with the MSMS capability. Um, for, for the eye mobility, uh, eye mobility is especially helpful uh, if we are looking at the isoform, isomer of the glycan. Yes. Great, thanks. John, did you have anything to add to that? No, I think that's um, that's pretty good. Great. Okay. Um, okay. So next question I see here. Um, what is, Lance? This one's for you. Uh, it's a it's a little vague, but I think uh, what we're getting at here is how to choose the best LC column. So the question is specifically, what functionality group should I evaluate to choose the best LC column? So maybe you can talk about uh, how people would select the right LC column for their glycan separations. Sure. Um, I mean, glycan columns are reasonably standardized in terms of they are predominantly hillic amide columns. Um, that's definitely the, the, the main standard. In terms of the specific column or the specific vendor that you would choose, that could depend on, you know, if you want to have, if you have a UHPLC and you want to run really fast methods, you may want to use a sub-2 micron column for the most resolution. If you're trying to have a method that, that goes into QC with older instrumentation, then that might not be the best column for you. And, you know, there are different columns definitely have different selectivity. So if you are running, you know, if you, have, if you have a column that you typically use and you run into problems about developing a method, then uh, it's, it's a good idea to try a different, try a different column. Even if they're both hillic amide, you could definitely get different selectivity, and it it might might pull apart the peaks of interest. Perfect. Thanks, Lance. Um, John and Alan, we've got another salic acid question here. I'll I'll put it to John first. Um, how does pH and temperature in solution affect the stability of salic acid? I'm, I'm not sure how much information we have on that, but uh, I'd like to get your thoughts. Um, that's actually a really good question, and I don't have a good answer for it. Um, I can do a little bit of research, maybe get back to the questioner with, um, with that. We can take this discussion offline. I'm okay with that. <laughs> Alan, do you, do you have any thoughts on it, or do you want to just take it offline? I think so, yeah. I mean, just to add that we have seen, um, you know, we have seen with some of the older methods that use uh, reductive amination that uh, some some care needs to be taken um, with the heated labeling reaction um, to optimize time and temperature to make sure that, uh, that you don't get uh, too much desilylation. So, so that's certainly been a consideration when looking at uh, labeling procedures for um, 2AB, APTS, any dye that uses reductive amination. Um, for dyes like instant PC um, that use a, um, a 50 degree labeling for a short amount of time, five minutes, um, this isn't, isn't so much of a concern. Great, thanks, Alan. Okay, um, so I think we'll have uh, time for one more question here. Uh, and this one is, is again, pretty vague, uh, but I think we, we have a lot of uh, ideas that could help here. So what are some new developments in LC and glycan analysis that could help streamline sample prep and analysis? I think, uh, you know, most folks in this panel have uh, provided presentations today that kind of highlight some of our new technologies uh, that, that do help with this workflow. Uh, so, um, you know, David, do you want to, to take this first, and then we can uh, maybe just go around the panel? Hmm. Interesting. So I'm not sure because right now uh, we, I, I haven't tested that. It's called a bio inner, bio LC column. I, I don't know whether that would help for the glycopeptide or glycan separation because those are the. I don't know, because uh, I don't have much experience on that. Maybe uh, Alex uh, can jump on it. Uh, yeah, thank you, Alex. 
I was going to say that, you know, we do have, you know, a BioNert LC and we have, uh, now we have uh, some hillock columns that we're packing with a peak line stainless steel hardware. So, you know, interaction with metals would be reduced uh, using that type of column. Uh, we don't currently have a hillock amide, but our, our Zwitter ionic hillock column, uh, hillock Z, that we uh, have it in the in BioNert hardware. That actually does work for glycopeptides, so that, that would certainly be an option. Great, thanks, Lance. Well, uh, yeah, this is Alex here. So, um, yeah, I mean, in terms of workflow advances, um, so since the integration of the, of the former Prozine portfolio, um, we brought on a lot of vend like end standards, um, which enables you to plug these into your workflow in terms of determining the glycan species that you have in your sample. So I think that's, a, that's an improvement on where things were before. And also since, since we've integrated into Agile and of course Prozyme, um, the former Prozyme products have the opportunity to be used together with Agile columns and also instruments. So I think that's what we're, that's what we're aiming towards is um, you know, providing you with a end-to-end -end workflow from from standards all the way through to all the way through to data analysis, and I can see that's only improving in the next uh, in the next year or so uh, with um, you know standard offerings as well as columns. Um, I should also point out that we do have um, we do have the NISMAB um, standard that is available now um, from Agilent. Um, there have been many publications on this on this material, uh, mostly in multi-laboratory studies, uh, which Agilent also contributed to. Um, so this is a, a pretty useful standard in terms of a monoclonal antibody that you can take off the shelf and plug into your uh, to your glycan workflow, be it intact mass um, on the glycopeptide level or on the released glycan level. Um, and, the, and we have a NISMAB compendium which uh, which uh, describes all the relative um, all the all the related techniques and you know, columns and consumables that. Um, that we offer to perform this analysis. Great, thanks, Alan. Well said. I think that's a great place to wrap this up. I really appreciate everyone's time today. Uh, thanks to all the panelists, uh, and thanks for everyone that submitted questions. Uh, we really appreciate it, um, and uh, hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.